Right, so next topic then, public spending, obviously given the pandemic and uh, the enormous borrowing that has gone on during the pandemic, that's potentially an area that uh, you might want to look at. So again, by public spending, obviously we mean spending by the government. And a few things that you'd need to be aware of and to know, and I'm sure you do at this point in your studies, but mainly here, obviously, we'll be talking about a budget deficit. And that means what exactly, Nathan? The spending that we're looking at the factor. Okay, yes, yeah, so we're talking about the fact that G, government spending, is bigger than T. And if G is bigger than T, so that means that essentially the government is spending more than it's earning, taking in, or if you want to say, you know, money out, it's bigger than money in. And as a consequence, Manisha, that means that the government has to borrow. borrow. Okay, so that requires borrowing. Okay, now Dylan, how does the government borrow? Issuing of bonds, okay, so we need to be aware of um, the whole idea of the government issuing debt essentially in the form of bonds. So if they want to borrow £100, they issue bonds to the tune of £100 and in receipt they get the monies for that. Um, so the bond market is essentially what you want to be looking at, the bonds in the bond market. So that used to be kind of all handled sort of in-house and that. Now it's the DMO, which of course handles the issuing of bonds and the DMO being the debt management office. So if the government wants to raise a certain amount of money, it's the DMO that kind of undertakes that, um, <clears throat> the raising of that cash. And we'll come back to that probably once we get some of this other stuff done. So we've got to borrow, but of course, every time that the government borrows, they're probably not paying any of the previous debt back. So if in year one, they borrow, you know, 10 pounds, and then in year two, they borrow, sorry, year two, they borrow another 10, and then year three, they borrow another 10. Well, cumulatively then, by the end of that period, they borrow 30 pounds, and that cumulative debt, of course, is what's known as our national debt. So let's just put a few sort of figures and numbers to these that you might want to maybe recall and remember for your exams. So at the moment, the national debt stands at about what, approximately? Depends where you look, but national debt figures at the minute? 2.6 trillion. Uh, okay, yeah, two point. Any sort of figure within that ballpark is going to be acceptable. So let's say it's about 2.3-ish trillion pounds. And we've borrowed exceptionally large amounts of money in recent years, obviously. So in the year of the pandemic, how much did we borrow in the first year of the pandemic when with the enormous period of extended lockdown? Yeah, cl cl more than that, so 400 billion that year. And then in the most recent years borrowing, the number was approximately, I think it was about 150 something, but let, let's just say circa approximately, you know, about 160 billion. Now, if you take that 400 billion figure, that's for one year. Now, bearing in mind, Dylan, that our economy in one year, the sort of the, the value of everything that we produce in the year is about, you know, it's a bit, it's a little bit more than our national debt, and it's about maybe 2.5, 2.6 trillion, that's us say. So that was an enormous sum of money to be borrowing in one year, you know, 400 billion. You're talking kind of knocking on for 20% of our entire What's, what do you call it? What's the word to describe the value of everything we produce in a year? GDP. Our GDP, tip top. So yeah, you're talking about 20% of that. So our GDP 
the value of everything that we're producing, goods and services in a year, we're talking around about the two point, you know, two point five, two point six trillion, something like that. <coughs> now I've talked, I've just talked here a little bit about ratios. So we've got a debt to GDP ratio. So if you think about how much debt, let's just say that these are the actual numbers. We've got, you know, our debt there about 2.3 trillion. And let's say that our GDP is about two and a half trillion. So most of the press that you're looking at these days will tell you quite rightly that of course our debt to GDP ratio is almost approaching 100%. We're almost in that terrible position where we almost owe as much as we can earn in a year essentially. And, and to sort of to start to tackle that, where, where does one start with that, Dylan? Where does one start? So we're almost almost at the hundred percent. Now, when we were about to sign up for the um, the euro many couple of decades ago, and you had to be a member of the exchange rate mechanism, and you had to sign up to all of these different targets. Um, well, there was kind of an acceptable limit for your debt to GDP ratio, and that is, so we have studied it, when we talked about kind of exchange rate mechanism and crashing out of the ERM, etc. It's not 100%, it's 60. So we're, we're a long way, if 60% is acceptable, well, we're a long way from 60% debt to GDP. And again, at, you know, similarly back in those days, but also, you know, considered to be still the acceptable kind of limits. This 400 billion, 20%, well, again, for that, 3% is considered acceptable and manageable over the longer term. So we're, again, we're, you know, 20% is so, so exceptional. As our learned colleague, David Smith, so, so often pointed out in his writings about the pandemic and so on, you know, this, the most we've had to borrow for such a long time. Okay, now, I've written here, so this word index linked, and this is the why, this is why Rishi is getting a little bit jittery at the minute, because particularly the pandemic related borrowings, a lot of that borrowing is index linked. Now, if it's index linked, it means that the, the debt will rise in line with inflation. So if I, I have an index linked pension, right, that hopefully that will see me nicely in my retirement, um, but that will hopefully rise in line with inflation as you would, you know, you would hope. But if our debt is similarly uh, financed, um, that is very quickly going to put a big hole in the government's finances and its ability, not necessarily to pay it back, but obviously its ability to, there's a big opportunity cost there. If you're spending 60 billion a month on debt, and, sorry, a year, a month. <laughs> if you're spending 60 billion a year on debt interest, which is what we are spending at the minute, I think 50 to 60 billion. Well, if that starts shooting up, that very quickly puts a hole in your plans for health, education, infrastructure, etc. So that's something to, to, to be looking out for. Um, the other thing is to say, of course, that the, most of the pandemic related borrowing is being done on sort of 50 year payback. So it's not so as if we have to pay this back tomorrow. It's, it's your generation, <laughs> it's your generation, ladies and gents, uh, it's your generation that'll be uh, having to foot the bill for this over the longer term. I mean, we've only just not that long ago paid off the debt from the Second World War. Um, so, you know, 50, so what age will I be? Oh, I'll still be, I'll still be, still be knocking out the triathlons uh, by then, hopefully. But yeah, 50 year, 50 year payback. Right, bonds then. So I should really have written this over here because these two, so, so the bond market, the debt management office, and the Bank of England and the QE and the rates are sort of interlinked. So we'll take it over here. So first of all, in the bond market, So what's going to be happening to the demand for bonds? 
Okay. So you could just do this very straightforward kind of basic supply and demand analysis. But the general gist of it is demand for bonds is on the up. Now, whether or not the Bank of England is deliberately doing that, is <laughs> that we certainly question its independence. So the price of the bonds are going up. But the crucial point here is when the price of the bonds go up, the yields, the, the interest rates, go Correct, there's that inverse relationship. So there's an inverse relationship between the bond yield so you've got the bond yield and the price of the bond. So we've we've sort of looked at this table before. So you've got your the price of a bond, hundred pounds or two hundred pounds. And then you've got your, your coupon, your payment on it, it says 10 and 10. It doesn't change, the coupon's the same, but what is changing is obviously the yield of the interest rate. So 10 as a percentage of 100 is obviously 10%, 10 as a percentage of 200 is 5%. So essentially, as the price of the bond is going up, the yield is falling. Now, this is where this, this would be an interesting discussion, if it arose in your exam, this would be an interesting discussion because in the, in the teeth of the pandemic, when the government needed to raise circa 400 billion, lo and behold, who was there to suddenly buy 400 billion via increasing QE by more or less that sum, uh, the Bank of England was there. And the Bank of England, therefore, demanding the bonds, pushing the, the price of them up, but more crucially, from the government's point of view, helping to keep just interest rates in general low and making money cheap and inexpensive for the government to borrow. So that 400 billion BD budget deficit, lo and behold, the Bank of England jumps in and there was a lot of if you were, I'm sure you do recall at the time, there's a lot of um, chat in the press as to you know how independent is the, is the central bank here from from the government. So it's a, an independence question. Um, independence. I mean, should it be independent? Of course, you know, really should, shouldn't it? We don't want we don't want that tool of. The interest rate being used for political gain, we want it to be used for economic management. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at in terms of our borrowing, our national debt, how it's financed, what's happening to interest rates as a consequence. So there, there, there is a plus side from interest rates because it helps keep interest rates in the money markets low. But longer term, what, what's going to happen? Well, the debt is obviously, we will have to start to address the debt. Rishi's already done that. So what's he done? He has frozen the thresholds. Meaning, of course, that you're going to get more people. It's that fiscal drag that we talked about in the inflation video. You're going to get more people dragged into the higher tax brackets and the tax take will obviously go up as a consequence of that. He has, of course, priced in for 2020, is it 2023 or 2024? What's going to happen to the 20 pence rate of tax? Nathan? The 20 pence, the 20% rate of tax, it's going to come down, down to, as in the most recent budget statement, 19%. So it's going to come down to 90. So 20 down to 90. Um, you might want to think about what uh, Laffer might say on that, and the Laffer curve, your tax revenue, tax rate. 
you know, a low tax, low tax economy, generally speaking, will bring in more tax revenue than a higher tax economy. Maybe, maybe that's the way they're thinking. But tax rises are obviously, if you think of your circular flow of income, they are withdrawals from the circular flow. So essentially, they're contractionary. And Dylan, what do they also do? So that this is a great opportunity here to sort of think about the multiplier as well. So maybe that's something I should have added here already. But, you know, when you withdraw more money, what's going to happen to the value of the multiplier? Correct, so it's going to decrease and therefore any injections will not have that larger multiplier effect. So that's something to, to consider as well. Um, and then just sort of lastly then, in terms of just really to, to point out that this, is, we've covered it already really, but the fact that it is 50 year debt, it's not debt that needs to be paid off tomorrow. And we're constantly recycling debt. And <clears throat> kind of, if, if 100 million is due today and the government doesn't have the money, they'll just issue another 100 million to, to finance it. We're very lucky because we are one of the, you know, the G7, very large economy, and we are able to borrow. So we don't, it's not something that we should be overly concerned about at the moment. And um, if you're a smaller country with such enormous levels of debt, then maybe that would be unsustainable kind of levels of debt. Um, so I think that's probably maybe it on public spending and just kind of where, where, the, where the budget sort of sits at the minute in terms of debt, how the debt is financed. Have I missed anything there? Well, I don't want a video of just silence. The what, sorry? The furlough scheme. The furlock? The furlough. The furlock scheme, okay, the furlough scheme. Um, And what would you have sort of just the fact that it's really super it was super expensive um, and obviously contributed a lot of that didn't it uh, yeah okay so that is true yeah it helps to not only do maintain that but to keep money in the hands of people as well um, and of course what did they do because they couldn't really spend so i was thinking about this this morning then just so thinking about our friend Robert Forrester at Virtu Motors and of course they've done so well on the back of the pandemic and why because during the pandemic people were able to save a lot of money and make those big purchases like you know extend their homes or buy new cars basically that's all they had to do with that that money that they had we should also maybe mention just on that point um the fact that you know the savings ratio and the amount of the amount of money that households do have stashed away is incredibly high at the minute. Now, whether or not they unleash that into the economy or because of the very hard times that we're going through at the minute, they might just choose to hold on to that. Um, there's another matter, but um, there's billions extra savings in banks, etc. at the minute. Okay, I think we'll... Stop at that and we move on to the next one. Might get the next one done.